Uh, I am uh, excited to have this discussion. It's always um, great to have feedback from all over the world uh, with some of the topics that we talk about. Today's topic is an introduction to ink-based glaucoma surgery. Um, I gave a talk a few months ago on CyberSight that touched on some of these topics, uh, but it was towards the end of the conversation and we didn't spend a lot of time on it. And I got some feedback about um, getting into a little bit more of the basics and then also into how we select which angle surgery we might do uh, in a given particular patient. So that's what we're gonna cover today. These are my disclosures. I, I work with a few of the companies that are in this space. So we're gonna start off with a question um, just to get an idea of who's um, on the call today. And the question is, how often do you perform ab interno or angle-based uh, surgery? Never, weekly, monthly, or is it just a few months or you know, once a year, twice a year, which would be rarely? I'll go ahead and give you a few seconds to answer. All right, so we have a big chunk of um, people who are listening in who almost never or never um, do angle surgery. And then another big group that might do it sometimes, but rarely. So this is actually the perfect um, topic for this group. And um, we'll get into some of the basics and see if we can transition some of the people who never do it to at least occasionally doing the procedures. Um, we're going to start off with another question here, uh, and uh, we'll have another two questions throughout um, this conversation. And, and this question is about where most of the resistance is to aqueous outflow. Is it in the collector channels, juxtacanalicular trabecular meshwork, aqueous veins, or does it reside somewhere within the sclera other than the collector channels? That's great. So the majority answered um, the right answer here, which is the juxtacanalicular trabecular meshwork. And that becomes relevant uh, because that is where most of the devices are actually um, targeting. So it'll make a lot of sense as we go through. The big question that we have in glaucoma therapy today, um, and really for the past handful of years, has been, is earlier surgical intervention the future of glaucoma therapy? Um, should we be thinking about surgery a little bit sooner because now we have options that um, have less complications, uh, a lower adverse event profile, and how is that going to ch change our treatment paradigm? And I like to show this slide. I think I showed it in my last conversation because it does go to show you a little bit of how um, glaucoma treatment has been thought of in the past. Um, one of our most famous studies is the trabeculectomy uh, comparison with tubes. And we know that tubes are worse than trabs because eventually we need more medications. Trabs are worse than tubes because there might be more failure. But have you ever considered that many of our trials, many of our studies are geared towards identifying which intervention is less harmful? So as opposed to intraocular lens technology where we're looking for the premium, best outcome, 2015 vision, in glaucoma, oftentimes we're talking about which one is least harmful, which one is least hurtful. And this is how MIGS really came to be. Uh, just to define MIGS, and this is Ike Ahmed's definition, it's an ab interno approach that is minimally traumatic. We want a low footprint when we go into the eye. At least modest efficacy that is sustained. Might not be trabeculectomy-like efficacy, but we want efficacy that is sustained and measurable. Extremely high safety profile. Again, think of this much like cataract surgery. We know that when we do cataract surgery, the majority of the time, the outcomes are very predictable and that it's extremely safe. And we're looking for a similar um, profile for some of the ab interno procedures that we do. And then of course, rapid recovery with minimal impact on quality of life. When we say MIGS, oftentimes from a regulatory perspective, we're talking about device implants. So not all of uh, MIGS would reside within the category of um, the angle-based procedures that we do that might be slightly outside of MIGS. And it's important to say that the umbrella term, probably more appropriately, is ab interno uh, angle-based surgery, of which MIGS is an extremely big part. And of course, the part that um, has had a lot of innovation over the last few years, uh, led by several of our colleagues. Trabecular bypass devices, this would be something like the eye stent or the hydrus device from Ivantis. Superchoroidal devices, which we'll get to towards the end because there's been a lot of news around superchoroidal devices. Filtration devices, and in this category, from a MIG standpoint, you have a device that sort of sits on the, uh, on the edge of either being a MIGS device or a little bit more than that towards the uh, um, trabeculite and, and drainage device, um, devices, and that would be the Zen implant and then internationally, not available in the US at least at this point, um, the in-focus um, shunt from Santon. <clears throat> so if you're thinking about adding angle surgery to your practice, 
Hopefully, um, many of you who answered never are at least thinking about incorporating this. You might have a patient population that would be well served by this type of procedure. And so that's what we're going to talk about. How do you think about incorporating it? We're, we'll talk about patient selection. We'll talk about day of surgery, preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative. And then we'll also talk about some follow-up pearls before getting into some case scenarios of when you would choose which device. Now, it used to be that when we talked about ab interno procedures um, or MIGS devices, we always talked about mild to moderate. Much of the approval process in the United States, <clears throat> and subsequently to that, the commercialization around the world has really focused on cataract surgery with a MIGS implant, traditionally thought of to be mild to moderate, and certainly it has a, a major role in that category. We all have our devices, and I'll talk about all of them today. From my standpoint, I usually think of goniotomy or endocyclophotocoagulation uh, with laser. And if my goal is to decrease medications and IOP, so I'm looking for a little bit more effort, sometimes I combine the two. We'll do goniotomy plus endocyclophotocoagulation. But I don't want you to think of ab interna procedures as only uh, being relegated to mild to moderate. We've also used the procedures in moderate to end stage disease. And we found a great deal of success in preventing or delaying trabeculectomy or glaucoma drainage devices. And in this case, goniotomy um, has been uh, one of our mainstays, but also combining it. You, know, you can combine goniotomy with uh, ECP. You can combine eye stent uh, with ECP, the so-called ICE procedure. And combining the inflow outflow procedures in some cases has allowed us to get to very low intraocular pressures and stave off trabs and tubes for a long period of time. And we always tell patients in these cases, let's try the less traumatic, low hanging fruit of doing an angle procedure. And if it fails, then we always have the capacity to go in and do a trabeculectomy and a, and a glaucoma drainage device procedure. So this is evolving. You can see from a risk to IOP lowering profile on the right-hand side, we're still learning. And perhaps now that we have um, Hydrus coming to the market in the US and it's available in other parts of the world, how does that marry with endocyclophotocoagulation? So we have a lot of tools that we can play with. And I think we should think of it more broadly, not just mild to moderate, but also how other patients might benefit. How about from a preoperative standpoint? When we combine with cataract surgery and you're consenting the patient, I think it's extremely important to always talk about plus or minus. And what do I mean by that? Sometimes you go in and you do the cataract surgery and you realize that the planned procedure that you were going to do with an implant might not be appropriate. Maybe the angle just won't receive the device or maybe your visualization post cataract surgery is not as adequate as you would like it to be. And in those cases, it would be good to have a conversation with a patient to say, that you may not be able to do, to do the ab interno procedure for glaucoma uh, because of other things that might come up, just to get them ready. Now, of course, 99.9% .9 of the time, uh, you're going to be able to complete the procedure, but it's good to be prepared. You should discuss recovery, that it may be a little bit different than cataract surgery. So if they have a friend who's had cataract surgery or if they've had only cataract surgery in one eye, let them know that the recovery might be slightly different. Uh, meaning that it might take a little bit longer to get to their optimal vision. In some cases, with some of the procedures, you might have a microhyphema for the first day postoperatively, um, which in my opinion is a good indication, and I'll go over that in a little bit, uh, but just have the patient prepared. Dilation, preoperative drops as usual. You don't change your routine when you're doing cataract surgery combined. Uh, and then another important point here that we have to be aware of is to discuss positioning with the patient. Oftentimes with almost all of the procedures that we do inside of the angle, we rotate the patient's head away from us and we rotate the microscope towards us. And we do that for about 45 degrees each. And in that case, there's a little bit of commotion in the operating room. The patient can hear you talking to the nurse. Uh, not many of the microscopes are self-positioning. Oftentimes the nurse has to help or you have to get an extra handle or there's noise when you're doing it. Just let the patient know that at some point during the procedure, there will be a repositioning that happens so the patient's aware of it. And I found that to be extremely valuable when the patient expects it to happen rather than to be surprised that after a period of not moving, you're asking the patient to move their head. They might be a little bit confused. And I often go over that in the preoperative area where I rotate the patient's head exactly to back. Now, in the case where it's standalone, um, we typically give antibiotics and pilocarpine preoperatively to constrict the pupil. Might give us a little bit of a better view of the angle. Otherwise, everything is as above when it's combined. Now, 
some, some pearls that I think would be very helpful intraoperatively, especially for your first few cases, which uh, for more than half of you, it would be um, your first case um, that you would do once you, you get rolling with angle surgery. Use a meiotic for the first few cases. Intraoperatively, you can use Carbacol, you can use Myostat, Myocol. Um, and in this case, that would be to constrict the pupil and enhance your view of the angle because you can get a little bit more depth, a um, little bit more filling with trampolining of the iris down away from your view. And for your first few cases, that might be very helpful. Certainly not necessary um, as you get more experienced. Routine cases and cooperative patients are extremely important early on. And um, when you start doing the angle procedures, we'll go into this a little bit um, more here in the next few slides. The positioning is a little bit different. The surgeon might be a little bit uncomfortable. You're used to doing cataract surgery maybe, but not doing angle surgery. You might have trained a little bit, but you're starting to do your first few cases. Having routine, clear anatomy, uh, being able to visualize very clearly in the clinic so that you know what to expect in the operating room, those are important things. Even though the majority of cases are done with topical anesthesia, for your first few cases, I think you should consider peribulbar anesthetic. It gives you more control. Your first few cases might take a little bit longer, so this way you can make sure that the patient is comfortable. At the conclusion, make sure you hydrate the wounds extremely well and you leave the pressure at 25. We want all of these eyes to be well pressurized to encourage flow of aqueous from the inside of the eye to the outside of the eye rather than any retrograde flow that might occur because you've opened up some of the blockage that existed in the angle. So just keep that in mind. Great hydration, leave the pressure a little bit high on the table. And in some cases, we leave a little bit of dispersive viscoelastic, about a 10% fill, which encourages flow outside of the eye in the early postoperative phase. Now let's talk a little bit about positioning. And again, a couple of these slides are gonna be familiar if you um, listened to my talk um, last year where we talk about some of the positioning issues that I think are extremely important. So if you compare the experience versus cataract surgery, um, the elbows are at a slightly different position. Depending on your dominant hand, your non-dominant hand will be stretched and holding the gonio lens, whereas your dominant hand will likely be doing the procedure and would be much more like FACO in that, in that regard. You're also working through two different areas. Um, the cornea, usually in cataract surgery, we're working through two incisions, whereas with ab internal procedures, we have the gonial lens sitting on top of the eye. So one hand's inside of the eye, the other hand's outside. There's also the um, thought here about bimanual versus intra-extraocular. Oftentimes with cataract surgery, we have two devices in the eye bimanually performing the procedure. And again, in the case of, of angle surgery, oftentimes we have one hand um, operating inside of the eye and the other really not participating in, in the maneuvers that are happening inside the eye. And then of course, from an operative space standpoint, that's one of the things that most new surgeons to the angle uh, recognize as being different. Instead of having the whole space between the posterior cornea and the posterior capsule when you're operating for cataract surgery, now you're working in a one millimeter space and you have to be conscious of the corneal endothelium, you have to be conscious of the ciliary body and the iris and make sure you don't do any sudden movements to the collateral tissues that are there. This is uh, an image of Shaquille Sharif um, who is operating and showing, I think this is a, a really nice image to look at before starting um, so you get a good idea of what the positioning might look like. Instead of both elbows at the side, in this case you see left hand outstretched with the gonial lens on the right hand side, and then the back is straight in both cases, so there might be a little bit more reaching for the gonio lens part of it. Um, you can tell he's an experienced angle um, surgeon. He looks very comfortable here, but you can see how very quickly, if you're not practicing before your first few cases, uh, then this can be uncomfortable. So practicing is, is very, very important. And then from a gonioscopy standpoint, this is perhaps the biggest deviation away from uh, what we're doing in cataract surgery as standalone. We have to be very proficient at doing gonioscopy in the clinic, extremely important to know what the anatomy is. And then of course, when you get into the operating room, you place viscoelastic to couple the gonial lens with the cornea. And I always like to say to put the, the viscoelastic on the bottom of the lens rather than putting it on the cornea. We tend to over uh, instill viscoelastic when we're placing it on the cornea. We can actually save some if we just place it directly on the lens. That also moves any heme away, any blood away from the cornea, and any air pockets are negated that way. So get in the habit of putting the viscoelastic on the bottom of the lens rather than on the cornea. 
You should also make sure that you're resting your hands. Similar to when you're doing capsular excess, you're always resting your hands in a way that is very stable. Exactly the same thing for when you're holding the gonia lens as well as any of the devices that we're using with the inserters or the um, handles. Don't use the lens to direct the eye. And this is something that you can teach and until the surgeon is doing it and recognize that they're doing it, they're not really gonna know how to really address the situation. There's a human tendency with that um, hand that's holding the gonial lens to direct the eye away or move it side to side to get better visualization. In essence, what you're doing is just depressing the cornea and causing stria. So we don't want that to happen. Uh, we want the gonial lens to float on the viscoelastic so that it's barely, barely touching or not touching at all. And then of course, zoom in. You see on the upper right hand side of the screen there, the image of the trabecular meshwork. Your image of the trabecular meshwork should be extremely um, uh, zoom down so that you can see all of the intricacies of, of the anatomical regions within the angle so that you're treating the appropriate tissue. Extremely important. With cataract surgery, you might be zoomed out a little bit more. In this case, we want you to be zoomed in. And this is a video here um, showing a surgeon practicing. This is John Berdahl out of South Dakota showing that uh, this is a great way to practice before you do your first few cases in standard cataract surgeries, if you're doing phaco emulsification, um, then at the conclusion of the case, you can tilt the patient's head, tilt the microscope, take your standard chopper, whatever you might use as a second instrument for cataract surgery, and just go in and learn how to move the device side to side. You're not really touching the trabecular meshwork, but you're getting used to the positioning with the gonial lens, with the tilting of the patient, and you're also getting the operating room staff used to what happens at the time with the tilting of the patient and the microscope. Extremely important. And one thing that's overlooked here is wound construction. Um, I think it's extremely important to not get into the limbal vessels. If you have oozing vessels, which is something that many cataract surgeons do, they place their wound slightly posteriorly. In the case of um, combined cataract surgery with ab interno surgery, if you have oozing vessels, that will make its way into the corneal surface and the viscoelastic and may make your view a little bit more difficult with angle surgery. So we always go a little bit more anteriorly uh, and get away from the limbal vessels when we're doing um, combined procedures. All right, so putting it all together, um, this is a patient who just had cataract surgery, tilted the head, tilted the microscope. In this case, this patient's getting goniotomy. Um, and you can see view is great. Maybe the surgeon could have zoomed in a little bit more so that they're seeing more of the um, details of the trabecular meshwork. But in this case, you see not a lot of movement, not a lot of stria in the cornea. So the surgeon is not using the gonial lens to direct the eye. Uh, the lens is floating on top of viscoelastic. And at the conclusion of the case, just gra grab the strip of trabecular meshwork and you're off and running. You're done with the procedure. So just an idea of how to put everything together to make it look smooth. I also like to mention this at the conclusion of um, almost all of the MIGS procedures that we do, we like to blanch the vessels if at all possible. So if you look in the upper left hand side here, you see some of the surface vessels blanching when we inject BSS into the eye. So we're inflating the anterior chamber, increasing the pressure, increasing the outflow. And oftentimes I tell the patients that we saw the sign that we're looking for post-procedure. In this particular case, it's post-goniotomy. Uh, we've unroofed three, four collector channels. And you can see that the blanching is, is significant. Always a good sign to know that the distal outflow system is patent. One common question that comes up is, should I do the MIGS procedure uh, or the ab interno angle procedure uh, before or after cataract surgery? And we just completed a study on this. We presented it in some of our national meetings. It'll be published in, in JCRS uh, pretty soon in the next few weeks. And what we did is we had the surgeons evaluate um, photos that were taken of the angle before and after cataract surgery to see if there's a change in the view. Would, would it be better to do it before cataract surgery because of visualization or after? And in the case in our study, um, we did it across multiple evaluators, three different um, surgeons evaluating the photos. We actually found no consistent difference that sometimes you could say that the visualization was better before cataract surgery. Sometimes it was after cataract surgery. Didn't find any predictive uh, points uh, for any of these. So do what you prefer. Um, I prefer to do it after cataract surgery. I like to get the cataract surgery done and, and open up the angle a little bit more. Uh, my colleagues like to do it before.
for the cataract surgery, which is ultimately completely fine. Now, how do we do postoperatively? Um, think of it very much as cataract surgery. Antibiotics, steroids, non-steroidals, if you like to use them. You could use pilocarpine to keep the angle open in cases where you might have done an incision or excision of trabecular meshwork with a goniotomy. What I would recommend is while the patient is on steroids to make sure that the patient is also using another glaucoma drop because steroid response glaucoma is something that can still happen with angle-based surgery. And we'll get into that a little bit more here. If it's standalone, you would do exactly the same thing, maybe minus the NSAIDs um, and just use a glaucoma drop along with the um, antibiotic and steroids. And then you see the patient back, of course, post-op day one, week one, you would do what you would typically do for your cataract procedures. Some follow-up pearls that I just mentioned, steroid response is not uncommon with ab internal procedures. That might be counterintuitive because we just said that most of the blockage happens at the juxtacanalicular trabecular meshwork. The thought is that steroid response glaucoma is an event that happens at the level of the trabecular meshwork. So if we're bypassing or removing the trabecular meshwork, why do we still have steroid response glaucoma? And the answer is we don't know. We, we really just don't know. There might be some effects that happen in the distal outflow system at the level of Schlumps Canal or collector channels. A lot of um, research is being done in this area with outflow imaging and trying to figure out how responsive the collector channels might be to different stimuli. Still learning in the meantime until we figure it out, please use a glaucoma drop while the patient is on steroids, especially if they have more advanced disease to make sure they don't have spikes. You can stop all of the medications if the pressure is below 15 and the patient doesn't have advanced disease, but watch closely. And keep one to two medications on as needed, depending on that nerve status, as I just mentioned. And then you can also restart medications as needed if the pressure isn't as controlled or at the target pressure that you were hoping for. All right, we're gonna get into a, another question here. Um, sorry, my screen is partially blocked. I'm gonna try and move that around here, but um, is steroid response glaucoma something that is um, still possible here um, after angle-based surgery? Um, so I'm gonna, so in this case, it's rare. Sorry, that, could, that word was covered. So steroid response elevation in IOP is rare after angle surgery, true or false? All right, so the answer is that it's not rare. Um, so the answer in this case, I'm gonna close this box here, is false, it is not rare. Um, and it, this is a really important point. If you're operating on patients and you're doing ab interno procedures, keep in mind that steroid response glaucoma is possible and you have to be vigilant for that, especially in a glaucoma population, as you know. So what is the case for goniotomy? I wanna talk a little bit about that because I spend a lot of my time in that, in that arena. So the ramp is, is critical in the case of the goniotomy procedures that we do. Placing the trabecular meshwork on stretch allows for a more precise cut. It's not enough to just go in and actually um, try to incise the trabecular meshwork because the tissue will bunch up. And in our case, we attempted, um, we, uh, in the development of, of devices for goniotomy, multiple different scenarios where we saw a lot of bunching up like wet tissue paper um, of, the, um, of the tissue as we were treating it. And so uh, we eventually came up with the idea of doing the ramp, which resulted in the tissue elevating to the dual blades and re leading to an excision of um, trabecular meshwork. So we've taken this into the clinic. This has been around um, since uh, 2015, doing multiple patients. This is just one example of taking average pressure from 17 to um, 12 with one year of follow-up and with medications also seeing a significant decrease of 1.6 to 0.6. The reason that I show this is because there is um, a significant um, potential for IOP lowering with um, not just goniotomy procedures, but many of the procedures that we do in the, uh, in the angle space. And I think we should keep that in mind that we shouldn't relegate this just to the mild to moderate, that in some cases it can work uh, extremely well. From a surgical technique standpoint, I think um, this will leverage all of the information that we just covered um, earlier in this discussion, um, the zooming in on the trabecular meshwork and making sure that the lens is floating, that we're not directing the eye. Uh, and you can see it could be a very straightforward procedure. It requires the skill set, of course, and that's why we're trained as ophthalmic surgeons. Uh, but if you put it all together, you can get many open collector channels, which you see here with these red dots, and a quite successful procedure that is streamlined with cataract surgery. I also like the fact that we can take trabecular meshwork um, tissue, and this is great from a, a feel-good standpoint. When you're doing surgery, you feel more like you're doing something. Uh, but 
also from a research standpoint, you can take the tissue, put it into a tissue library and study it over time. And we have done a lot of histology on the trabecular meshwork and we're learning some things that we didn't know before. One thing in particular is how does the trabecular meshwork respond to different procedures? We really don't know a lot about trabecular meshwork healing. And in this case, I received some tissue from uh, Devinder Grover and uh, Ron Feldman to um, analyze after they had performed GAT procedure, which is, uh, an, again, an incision creating a flap of, of trabecular meshwork. Um, they had scarring um, far down the road after doing the procedure, and they went in and, and did an excisional goniotomy, and they sent the tissue over to the University of Colorado. And we were able to do the analysis, and we saw uh, what, for me, was the first time to identify fibrosis post-incisional uh, goniotomy. Um, this is something that can happen with all procedures. It can happen post-excisional goniotomy. It can happen post any of the implants. And we're starting to recognize this more and more. We're looking for it, but we're also analyzing the tissue. And I'll show you another example of that here. So this is a case where I had implanted an eye stent two years previous, and I could tell that the eye stent was actually moving away from the canal, um, not in position as it should have been, and the pressure was going up. So we went in, we took the eye stent out, and we performed an excisional goniotomy. During that excisional process, we noticed a film that was over the site where the device was, as well as over the trabecular meshwork. You see the strip of trabecular meshwork there. But you see this film that will indicate with some arrows here in a little bit. And it was quite tightly adherent to surrounding trabecular meshwork, as well as to the area where the device was sitting. So we took the tissue. We excised it and we did analysis on it. And what we found was a great deal of fibrosis. That whole film was basically a fibrotic sheet. There was normal pigment on one side, low pigment on the other with uh, less trabecular meshwork cells, but this very broad sheet of fibrotic tissue. Um, and um, this is something we continue to learn about. We published this last year in Journal of Glaucoma, um, a series of patients, and we're continuing to collect tissue and we're seeing the same thing. Anything you do in the angle could potentially lead to fibrosis, and it's something that has to be addressed in the future, but we have to learn exactly what the process is, and, and that'll help us stop it. These are some other samples of harvested tissue um, post um, stent placement within the trabecular meshwork. They all essentially look the same. Less trabecular meshwork cells, less pigmentation, fibrotic sheets um, that covered the device. So I'm ready to start angle surgery. Which one do I choose? Um, and this is, this is really a hard question. Um, and I'm going to try and answer it a few different ways. In my opinion, glaucoma is becoming a field where the past best patient experiences are now becoming the expectation. Patients want a safe option that provides IOP lowering. And they also want the added benefit of decreasing the medications. Most of my patients want to be off their drops if at all possible. Surgeons want something that's predictable, something that's safe and economically feasible. And the economic pressures all around the world um, are really driving um, some of the training that we're doing, some of the decision making that we're doing. But of course, we want to be safe and we want to be effective. So here's a case example, 65 year old patient with primary open angle glaucoma. Goal pressure is 15 in the right eye, current pressure is 18. And the patient has a visually significant cataract. No prior glaucoma surgery, currently on a prostaglandin analog. Visual field shows early nasal step that is progressing slowly. And the question here is, what is your best surgical option? I want you to hold off on the answer here and I'll go, on, go through some scenarios here. So what's on the menu? What are the choices? You see on the right-hand side, this table, it's continuously expanding. We have a lot of new devices coming in. We've had you know, Trabectome for a very long time, iStent, Trab360. Now there's a version called Omni720. Uh, ABIC, GAT, KDB, there are multiple, multiple choices for conventional outflow. And you see some of the other choices there. It used to be that I would say there are many choices, but a poor understanding of where things fit in due to a lack of data. And that's evolving. I don't think I, say, I can say that safely anymore because evidence-based medicine is increasing and we're starting to get data that will drive decision-making. This is just a picture of all of the choices, just a partial picture because we have many, many more that um, just didn't, I didn't have room on this slide to put everything on there. So here's how I think of things. For conventional outflow, you'll see a video of the hydrus um, implant being placed on the right-hand side. My first choice is to go after conventional outflow. It's safe, it's the most physiologic. It also um, gives us a chance with a small footprint without putting a device. We can do things like goniotomy that we talked about that will not leave a device behind, so very small footprint. 
all devices and all um, approaches have a, uh, a role. And I think we're learning how to personalize with the long-term data that we're getting. I think all of them have a role in mild glaucoma with cataract surgery. In cases of standalone and perhaps more advanced disease, my go-to is goniotomy. And, and of course, I'm biased in that area because we've done a lot of work in that area. I also like the fact that goniotomy is economically sound. So when I'm traveling and I'm doing surgery in other places around the world, oftentimes we don't have access to the very expensive devices that are implanted. And in this case, we can give patients access to the benefit of angle surgery without the expense um, that goes along with some of the implants. We're headed towards accessing several collector channels, combination procedures, combined with medications, in-office procedures. So there's a lot of things that are happening in this space. From an outflow um, standpoint, there's also the unconventional pathway. And this one has had a lot of news recently, as many of you probably know. Supercoidal implants, this is not my first choice, uh, never was my first choice because of the unpredictable nature of IOP lowering. It also had a higher adverse event profile than I desired for my angle procedures like hypotony. A lot of our patients were complaining of pain uh, and of course endothelial cell loss, which ultimately led to the um, only device on the market um, the SIPAS implant being pulled and uh, further studies underway to figure out what to do to, to make the adverse event profile better and potentially put it back on the market. Um, so where does it fit into my algorithm? Um, I would sometimes consider doing it instead of a second tube if the patient had extensive scarring. But of course, now that it's pulled from the market in the US and, and globally, um, we don't really have access to that. And we'll have to wait and see with new materials, different designs, maybe combining it with different medications. We have to modify our expectations with the suprachoroidal space at this point. So what's on the menu for full thickness? We have Zen, Trab, Express, glaucoma drainage devices. In the category of more minimally invasive, perhaps not MIGS type, but more minimally invasive would be Zen. Uh, and in the future in focus, um, and we don't have access to that currently, but I know that there are multiple studies running around the world where some of you might have access to it. It is not my first choice because my major goal is to avoid a bleb. I'm trying to get away from having a bleb with all of the co potential complications. Zen, in our experience, has a 40% needling rate, which was too high from our standpoint to implement it routinely in our practice. And then um, the possibility of treating glaucoma earlier with some of our other approaches really pushes off the need for a bleb further and further. So it hasn't really risen up to the top one or two approaches that we use. Where does it fit into my algorithm? In the case of, of Zen, elderly Caucasian patients, lightly pigmented, tend to do better than others. And traditional TRAB or EXPRESS are still my go-to in this case. If I'm looking for a bleb, I'm usually doing a trabeculectomy. Uh, where are we headed? Back to ab externo. Um, we're actually doing many of our Zen's ab externo now instead of ab interno because of the predictable placement of the device. We'll see how in-focus microshunt from Santin performs. We'll see how different designs might work better. And do we have anti-scarring strategies? It's not enough to just do a, a bleb. We have to do a better bleb, and I don't think we're quite there yet. And this is a video of ECP being performed. Expectations here is that you can get 25% IOP lowering. Um, I'm a big fan of ECP. I think it works in a lot of uh, cases where other devices might not work as well. You can go through two incisions and get 360 degrees um, of treatment easily combined with outflow procedures, and it's the go-to when conjunctiva is compromised in my case. All right, so back to the patient case. 65-year-old with POAG and goal of pressure is 15, pressure is 18, no prior glaucoma surgery, nasal step that's early. In this case, I'm sure you could predict uh, from everything that we just said, I would go to goniotomy as my procedure of choice. I think it's safe, effective, exposes several collector channels. But what if I change this slightly and I say, prior glaucoma drainage device surgery, maximal tolerated medical therapy, visual field, uh, nasal step progressing rapidly. How do I change that? In my case, I would do 360 ECP and perhaps combine it with one of the outflow procedures, whether it's goniotomy, eye stent, hydrus, any of the, the choices that we have. But that combo when you're looking for um, more advanced disease and, um, and doing things a little bit more aggressively, that would be a choice. Now, what if the goal pressure was 10 Patient had no prior glaucoma surgery, uh, currently on maximal tolerated medical therapy. Visual field shows a steady progression of the nasal step. In this case, guess what? You know, even though the talk was about ab interno surgery, we're still back to traditional trabeculectomy. It's still my go-to when the target is 10. Uh, this is one of the areas that hasn't changed sig significantly over the years. We're still using that as a gold standard for IOP lowering. Maybe some of the new devices that are coming like 
and focus will we'll, we'll change that. But this will stay tuned because we don't know. All right, last question. Which glaucoma surgery is most likely to succeed when targeting an IOP level of 10 to 12 millimeters of mercury? All right, so we just talked about that, trabeculectomy, still the go-to. All of you are familiar with that, obviously. 5% gave goniotomy, so I think trabeculectomy is still the, uh, the gold standard here when looking for very low pressure. All right, so where are we headed? Uh, more choices will further our ability to personalize care, similar to tailoring IOLs or glaucoma medication choices. Head-to-head -head data, we're getting a lot more studies that are comparing devices to each other and approaches to each other. Educational outreach, a lot of the companies that are selling these devices and approaches are training surgeons and training residents and fellows. So we're getting a lot more education in the, in the field, which is um, only a good thing. Learning more about combining inflow and outflow. Also drug delivery will start um, making an impact. A lot of the meetings that I'm going to now used to be very heavy on MIGs. Now it's very heavy on drug delivery. And I think that combination will eventually happen. Economic drivers may dictate a non-implant approach versus MIGs. So depending on where you operate, what community you might be in, what geography you might be in, you might not have access to all of the devices that some other surgeons have. So looking for non-implant, less expensive approaches might be very beneficial. And robust office space IOP lowering procedures are the next target. For minimally invasive, we're trying to get away from the operating room and try and do things in procedure rooms and even potentially at the slit lamp. And I think we're gonna start seeing more and more of that over the years. One of the big messages that I like to give um, when talking about this is the fact that we now have options. It used to be just 15 years ago or so when I was in training that we just talked about trabs and tubes. We talked about maximizing therapy and then going to incisional surgery with full thickness procedures. Now we have many options, which is a beautiful thing. Thank you very much and I'm happy to take some questions. Which gonioscope, uh, gonioscope do you recommend? Um, there are multiple um, gonioscopic lens, um, lenses that are out there. There's the Hill lens uh, with the notch for um, operating through an incision with the lens sitting on the, on the cornea, which is um, something that um, we use frequently. There's the Vold lens that has teeth on the bottom to help with resting and sitting on the conjunctiva rather than the cornea. You also have many disposable versions, so it might be more cost effective to get multiple disposable versions rather than what tends to be a, a fairly expensive investment with gonioscopic lenses. Um, the fact is here, the, the major differentiators with non-disposables, the view can be a little bit better. Uh, and of course, over time might be cost effective if you're doing a lot of procedures. Um, so take that into account. But there isn't one go-to lens that I can say is head and heels above all of the others. Um, and in different countries, you might have access to different uh, vendors for the gonioscopic lenses. Uh, this might be one to talk to colleagues who are doing surgery uh, in the angle that are close by and to see what they're using because you'll, you'll probably have access to, to those lenses a little bit easier. Um, let's see, sorry for my bad connection. What's RAMP stand for? RAMP is actually just the word RAMP. Um, so in, in this case, uh, RAMP is where you start on the bottom and you move your way to the top. And in that case, the, in, in the description, the trabecular meshwork sits on the bottom ramps up to the top and presents itself to the two blades. And that was really the big breakthrough for us when designing uh, the dual blade devices. Without the ramp, we really weren't getting consistent um, parallel incisions to produce an excisional uh, goniotomy. So which is the best procedure for NTG, LTG? Great, uh, great question from Hamad uh, Ramzan. And in this case, um, very um, long conversations have been had about uh, which one would be best for NTG. If your target, and that's probably the most important thing rather than whether it's NTG or POAG, uh, general POAG. If your target is 10 to 12, I still think trabeculectomy is your best bet. However, a lot of NTG, LTG patients have a pressure of 16, 18, and in those cases, our go-to typically is doing a goniotomy plus or minus an ECP. And if we can get those patients to a pressure of 13, 14, and that might be our goal pressure, then you can go the ab interno or MIGS route. Uh, again, if you're targeting 10, it's still trabeculectomy in our hands. Um, a question from Dr. Pai. Uh, standalone MIGS is an accepted uh, treatment. It is. Um, we, um, in my case, about half of my procedures when I do goniotomies, for example, um, are, are standalone. Um, I go in, I do the, trabe uh, the trabeculotomy or trabeculectomy of the um, strip of, of tissue. And uh, in some cases, I, I tag along with ECP without having done cataract surgery if the patient is pseudophagic, of course. In, in cases of some of the MIGS procedures, the implants 
Um, that might be a little bit different. It depends on the regulatory status. In some places around the world, you can only do combined implant with cataract surgery because that's how it was approved. Uh, but with the goniotomy procedures and others, you have more flexibility with ABIC, with um, with Visco 360, with those, you can actually do them standalone without having to do the cataract surgery. All right, question here. Where do non-penetrating deep sclerectomies stand in your management algorithm for treating glaucoma effectively? Now, many of my colleagues um, that I've talked to about this in Europe uh, might shake their heads at this, but I don't do non-penetrating deep sclerectomy. The reason for that is we were not trained heavily on that in the United States. Very, very few physicians in the United States um, do deep sclerectomy. And for a major reason for us has been that our experience has been that trabeculectomy is, is more effective and more reproducible in our hands. Many of the non-penetrating deep sclerectomies that I tried earlier in my career were most effective when I converted them to a, a traditional trabeculectomy. Again, this is something that has to do with training. Many of the surgeons that that I know uh, around the world that do deep sclerectomy, uh, do it in a very fantastic fashion, very elegant surgery, and um, they would probably be better um, answering that, that specific question. How do you manage hyphema during or after goniotomy? So this is a very important question, and um, I touched on it slightly um, in the past where when I'm doing goniotomy and I'm excising a strip of trabecular meshwork, if I don't see reflux of blood into the anterior chamber, I see that as a bad sign. I want to see reflux. I want to know that the collector channels are patent, that that distal outflow system is patent. And at that time, if you inflate the anterior chamber adequately, let's say you haven't completed the treatment and you want to move some of the heme out of your way, you can inflate with a um, viscoelastic, you know, dispersive or, or cohesive, uh, really up to your preference, and then complete the treatment. Now, one of the management things to do at that point is I routinely leave about 10% fill of dispersive viscoelastic in the anterior chamber at the conclusion of all of my angle procedures. In the case of goniotomy, for example, whether there is a little bit of trickling blood from the collector channels or not, I'll typically leave some uh, dispersive viscoelastic, and that encourages the outflow from the inside of the eye to the outside of the eye. And hyphemas post-operative day one are extremely rare in my practice at this point. Occasionally, you might see a microhyphema that resolves after day one. Um, we've done a review of almost 300 eyes in our practice, and in, I believe, all of the patients, if there was a, a hyphema post-operative day one, uh, overwhelming majority were gone by week one and all were gone by month one without any further treatment. So not that big of a deal if, uh, if you're handling, handling it correctly. And adding the dispersive at the end of the case, the dispersive viscoelastic 10% fill will pretty much fix that problem um, for you. All right, let me see here. Standalone MIGs, is there increased risk for developing cataract? Uh, most of the standalone MIGs procedures that I do are in pseudophagic patients. There is a risk of increased cataract development if you're operating in a phagic patient and you enter the eye for any procedure. Um, so that is something to keep in mind. Now, of course, if you cause trauma, if you bump into the lens, that will make it 100%. But in the case where I'm in, if the patient is phacic, the overwhelming majority of my patients have um, some degree of cataract when they're phacic. And if I'm going in anyway, I want to give that patient the maximal benefit of going to the operating room. And I'm typically combining cataract surgery uh, with the MIGS procedure. There is a question here at the top. You said you prefer angle procedure after cataract surgery. What is optimum timing in your view between the two procedures? Um, so what I meant by that, and thanks for allowing me to clarify, what I meant is in the same sitting in the operating room, I'll do the cataract surgery, and then immediately after that, I'll do the angle surgery. So I do combine those two. What I don't do is start off by doing the angle procedure and then go on to um, cataract surgery. I don't do a stage procedure as we typically do with our trabeculectomies. I, I typically don't combine phaco trab or phaco tube um, because I think that the trabs and the tubes do better when I'm not the phaco. So I'll either do the phaco first, wait a few weeks uh, or even months, depending on the IOP lowering that I get from the phaco, and then do the trab or the tube. And of course, with the topic uh, here, if I do that, I'm often combining the, the phaco with one of the angle procedures and try and push off that trab and tube even more. However, with MIGS and AB interno angle procedures, I do them in the same sitting. I don't, I don't separate the two, and I like to do it immediately after I'm done with the phaco emulsification. How do you decide to do uh, 180 versus 360? 
Um, this is an, uh, and this is specifically, I believe specifically for goniotomy. Yeah, there are two questions that are similar here. It says, how do you decide for goniotomy? And then Nuruddin um, asks a similar question. I assume that's also for goniotomy. And so we, there's been a lot of research to see how many clock hours of goniotomy are necessary. And it turns out anything above, uh, in our experience and others, um, anything above four clock hours of goniotomy doesn't really give you more IOP lowering. You've accessed four or five collector channels within those four clock hours, and that gives you adequate um, avenues towards IOP lowering. Some people might say it's always good to do 360 uh, because if you have some scarring, you don't have the scarring in all of the 360s, so you have a higher chance of actually making it work. And my answer to that is I actually want to go in and do as little as possible to get the most efficacy. If you're doing 360 goniotomy, you're treating more tissue, you're causing potentially more inflammation. In many instances, in all instances that I know, you're actually treating tissue that you don't have immediate visualization of if you're cannulating. I don't like to treat what I don't see. And so many of those procedures also cause an incision rather than an excision of uh, trabecular meshwork. And so the leaflets that remain can then fuse um, more uh, readily, at least in my experience with the procedures that I've done. So we typically do three, four clock hours of excisional um, goniotomy and um, that's all we do and we, we've had great success with that. All right, there's a specific patient question. My patient, age 29, diagnosed with LTG at the age of 26 on Travitan, pressures 12 both eyes. Should I go for TRAB? Um, I wish we had more time to take a deeper dive. You know, if the disease is advancing, if it's not advancing, what does the visual field look like? Uh, but let's just assume, to answer this question, that the patient is still getting worse with a pressure of 12 on Travitan. You can't use any of the other medications that might be available and you're thinking about doing something for IOP lowering, I still think TRAB is the best choice. If you wanna to get to a pressure of nine to 10, um, then I think that's gonna be your best choice out of all of the options that we have today. Uh, can we do trabeculotomy as done for congenital glaucoma in adults as this also involves cutting TM as done with a KDB? So this is, a, this is a really a very important question. And historically, if you look at some of the work um, that was done uh, with adult goniotomies. And um, what you start to see is that the incisional goniotomy, uh, as is traditionally done with congenital glaucoma with an MVR blade or a needle where you're just placing an incision, it had horrible results in adults. Um, almost all of the adults in the series that have been published failed to lower their IOP with, a, with an incision of the trabecular meshwork. And the reason is the trabecular meshwork leaflets tend to refuse um, to reanastomose to, um, and then causes an elevation um, in the um, intraocular pressure. So that was actually the major drive behind performing excisional goniotomy. We were trying to limit as much as possible how many um, mil um, microns of uh, trabecular meshwork remained um, that could then fuse together. Uh, and that's why I think we're seeing more success in adult patients. So if you look at the historical data from, uh, from trabectome with the electrocautery of the trabecular meshwork moving removing more of a, a, a tissue than just an incision. And then subsequent to that, um, KDB with an excisional goniotomy using the ramp and the two blades. We're seeing much more success than we saw in the 1930s, 40s uh, with some of the series that were just an incision of the trabecular meshwork. Where exactly do you perform your goniotomy at the pigmented TM or non-pigmented TM? So depends on the device that you're using. In the case of, of uh, KDB, we're going in and we're removing uh, as much of the trabecular meshwork as possible and the blades really take care of it. So you don't have to aim. As long as you're in Schlem's canal, the blades are taking care of the non-pigmented and pigmented TM. In the case of doing something like a GAT procedure, uh, Devinder Grover, Ron Feldman um, have talked about this in, in some of the meetings. I, I'm not 100% sure if they published on this, but what they're noticing is that um, the suture goniotomy is actually causing uh, an incision in the upper part of the trabecular meshwork near um, Schwalbe's line. And that's the main area where they see the treatment happening. Things like Trav 360, uh, Omni 720, those tend to really cause that, that rip or tear in the trabecular meshwork that happens in the middle um, in some experiences, but um, really hard to predict in that case um, exactly where that might be. It might be different from patient to patient. Uh, let's see here. In which cases do you particularly go for goniotomy? 
again, my biases, I think, are, are pretty clear here because we've worked extensively with goniotomy. I tend to use it on, on a lot of patients. Um, it's my go-to device, but it has particular success in pigment dispersion, pseudoxfoliation, chronic angle closure, where you can use it to remove some of the anterior synechia and then do a uh, goniotomy. Uh, we usually get home runs out of those. We, we usually get a lot of IOP lowering um, out of those um, procedures and um, certainly our go-to. But primary open angle glaucoma, NTG with a, with a mid to high teen pressure. We also use uh, goniotomy routinely in those cases before going to something more invasive. Like I said earlier, if we can go to something that's minimally invasive, like a, like a goniotomy in comparison to a trab or a tube, we go for that and we tell the patient in some circumstances, if you fail, we still have the option of doing a trab or a tube. So I like to go less invasive before more invasive. All right, question here, seven-year-old male, um, minus 12 diopter, um, sphere both eyes, 0.8 cups, uh, both bilateral microsphere fakia with closed angles. IOP controlled with track con. I'm not sure what that is, sorry. What to do? Uh, this is um, a much more extensive conversation, but seven-year-old male, high myope, um, and you also have uh, significant cupping with microspherophakia, uh, and the angles are also closed. Um, so depending on the exact examination, uh, what the trabecular meshwork looks like, what the angle looks like, um, you could try um, doing a um, goniotomy first. Um, it could be a suture goniotomy with GAT. It could be any of the uh, the choices that you might do. It depends on the maturity of the angle. What does that look like? Is this something that has been longstanding? Is it more of a, a congenital type picture of, or, a, or a JOAG um, type picture? Uh, but um, oftentimes in, in patients that have reached the age of seven, we're talking more, especially in the picture that you described, we're talking more of a, a full thickness procedure, um, like a tube in this case, um, to um, uh, get better control over a longer period of time. This is a tougher case. Uh, might be worth uh, putting it on the cyber site um, discussion board uh, if you have access to it, and then tag me, and we can go back and forth, and I can dig in a little bit deeper with some of the the data that that I could use to answer that. Uh, and I see it's Travacom, so thanks for adding that. We don't have access to Travacom in the United States, so it's a little bit different for us. Um, IOP reduction with KDB is better in pseudoxfoliation, pigmentary glaucoma, or POAG. Um, I can tell you that we more typically have higher uh, percentages of a uh, big decrease in pressure post exfoliation and pigmentary glaucoma treatment with goniotomy. Um, although we do have that with POAG and others, you see this um, dramatic lowering of pressure with pseudoxfoliation, pigmentary, as well as chronic angle closure, and you see that um, even more consistently than some of the other processes. Um, it seems like the pressure um, for most of the studies that have been done, hundreds of eyes that have been done, usually somewhere around 12 and a half to 13 and a half and we can get most eyes to that level. But pseudoxfoliation, pigmentary glaucoma, and chronic angle closure usually come to my clinic with higher pressures, and that's why we can see that more dramatic lowering. Uh, and because most of the blockage in those processes is definitively at the trabecular meshwork, whether it's plugging or loss of trabecular meshwork cells in the case of pigmentary glaucoma, we tend to see a more dramatic decrease in pressure, uh, and it's our go-to with those procedures. We see a lot of success with that. Uh, one more question here. Let's see, where is the role of lasers going in the future for POAG as compared to the MIGS devices available in the market now? And I assume by that you mean things like SLT and ALT. Those still have a major role uh, in our practice and as primary therapy, even before starting medications. Uh, what we're seeing now in the in the US at least is a slight decline in the use of SLT and ALT. And, and nobody's quite sure whether it's because of economic drivers or that. Many of our patients have been treated already with these and have moved on to different procedures uh, or that we're retreating less. We're not actually sure why that's happening. But in my practice in particular, SLT still has a major role, primary therapy in those who may not tolerate medications or may not be able to instill medications because of physical limitations or lack of adherence to therapy. Um, there are new lasers that are being tested, um, different wavelengths that are being tested. I think SLT is pretty dominant, um, at least in the US and Europe, and we'll see how that might factor over time with new technology. Uh, most of the technologies that I'm familiar with are very similar to what we're doing with SLT, so there won't be much of a differentiator. For how long uh, does goniotomy control the IOP lowering? Our data right now goes out to about three years, consistently lowering pressure in the majority of patients. Um, so I would say stay tuned. We don't have the five, 10-year data that we have for TRABs and tubes. 
but we do have significant two-year data and uh, building significant three-year data and seeing very similar outcomes to the six and 12-month data that have been published. Uh, two-year data is being published fairly soon, I believe, in the next two months. Um, so you can see that the numbers look very similar to, um, to what they do at one year. All right, in primary angle closure glaucoma, electron microscopy has shown damage to angle structures. Is goniotomy helpful in such cases on the long term? So this actually goes back to um, the chronic angle closure that I just discussed um, with the last couple of questions. I think uh, in my practice, um, some of the, the best outcomes have been in chronic angle closure, where I go in and I remove the anterior synechia, basically gonia synechia lysis, and remove the trabecular meshwork. The trabecular meshwork has been damaged, um, and a lot of the damage happens either from the anterior synechia or chronic contact with the iris. And removing that tends to expose a very healthy distal outflow system um, that hasn't been, um, that hasn't responded in similar ways to some of the primary angle closure patients where it appears that a lot of the obstruction might be in the collector channels. Um, so in these cases, we do see dramatic lowering, um, and it, um, as you say, might relate to primary damage within the angle structures, particularly the trabecular meshwork. And I think there's low risk for doing uh, goniotomy in these cases. You can always go to trabs and tubes if needed. Can we repeat goniotomy in one eye? Um, so you, you can't repeat it, in, you cannot repeat it in the areas where you've already done the goniotomy. But if you've done four o'clock hours and you go in, you can also treat another three, four o'clock hours that were not treated um, initially. I would not recommend that. So the way that I practice is I try goniotomy once, I do three to four o'clock hours. If the patient comes in a year later and their pressure is going up and I have to do something else, I typically go to a trab or a tube. I don't go to a repeat goniotomy. Um, I think the goniotomy has given them a chance to push back any of the more invasive procedures but the eye is telling you that it needs a little bit more than what the goniotomy is providing. Sometimes you see the patients come back and they have a film over the goniotomy site, whether it was incisional or excisional goniotomy, or again, the devices as I showed in the video with eye stent previously. And in those cases, you can go in and you can remove that film, which we've done, but there's a tendency for that film to redevelop if the patient has a tendency for that. So again, we typically go to straight trabeculectomy or glaucoma drainage device in cases where the goniotomy has failed.